took six days and created earth and moon, the stars and sun. On the seventh day he rested from the work that he had done. Then he blessed it, made it holy as a gift for Just how this world began. Holy day, purified, set apart, sanctified, enter into joy divine in a temple made of time. See him worship. Sabbath as his weekly custom was. Feel the fury of the rabbis, for he would not heed their laws. So they killed him on a hillside as the sun began to fade. But he even kept the Sabbath. As they laid him in the grave Holy day, purified Set apart, sanctified Enter into joy divine In a temple made of time Forsaken and forgotten, desecrated and profaned. But the sacred fourth commandment is still valid and unchanged. Hear the Father gently calling, if you love me, heed each one, not for merit for salvation but because you love my son holy day purified set apart sanctified enter into joy divine in a temple made of time holy day Happy Sabbath, Church. Um, it's a great day to worship the Lord for... <laughs> it's great to worship the Lord. And may we worship the Lord and sing a song for our first song. We would like to sing In the Garden, hymn number 487.
Amen. Our next song will be hymn number 547, Be Thou My Vision. song for a third song let us sing all things bright and beautiful hymn 93 
Our call of worship is coming from 2 Samuel 14, 14. Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, please stand for our next hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let us pray. Eternal Father, our God, we invoke your name and invite your presence to be with us on this holy Sabbath day that you created for us. We pray, O Lord, that through the singing of hymns, the reading of scripture, and the hearing of your word will bring us divinely closer to you. We pray these things in the mighty and matchless power of your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue to sing our opening song, um, hymn number 295, Chief of Sinners.
It is now the part of the worship where we approach God in prayer. So if you can kneel or assume a position of reverence, uh, we're going to talk to God. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to see another Sabbath. As we see again and again, that is not promised. Thank you for protecting us throughout the week, Lord, and thank you for bringing us here again to worship together. Lord, we ask that you be with the families in Texas that are hurting and all over the world, Lord, tragedies everywhere, in Ukraine and in various places elsewhere, Lord. We ask that you please comfort, send comfort, Lord, and be with those who are hurting and those who need you. Lord, we ask that you also be with us here as we go to work about our daily activities, to school, Lord, we ask that you allow us to be comforters to others. Please send us as your ambassadors, Lord, to, to comfort, to show others of you, and to be example for you, so that when others see us, they can say they have seen you. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, even with all that is going on around us, Lord. We ask that you just please give us a heart of thankfulness. Show us those things that we maybe even neglected to see. But certainly we're thankful for our life, our health, our families, Lord, and all the other little things, unseen things that you do for us each and every day, Lord. Please help us to be more thankful and to see, and to see all that you have done for us. Lord, please be with the speaker today and those who are serving you today on the pulpit. Lord, please open up our minds and our hearts. Allow us to receive the message that you intended us to receive and help us to not only be hearers, but to take that and to be doers and to apply it to our lives. We ask all these blessings in Jesus' name, amen. Come on up, kids. 
Today I have a story about an airplane and a miracle. So come on up. This is a story that happened in the country of Ethiopia a long time ago. And it happened to a missionary pilot named Bob. And Bob got a call on the radio one day from a village called Green Lake in Ethiopia. And the person on the other end of the radio was a nurse who lived and worked at Green Lake. <coughs> Excuse me. And she said, we have an outbreak of disease in the village and we need vaccines quickly, quickly, quickly to be flown to us because people will die if we don't get the vaccines quickly. And so Bob said, okay, I'm willing to do it, but there's only one problem. There is no landing strip at Green Lake. And she said, the men from the village will make a landing strip. You tell us how long it needs to be and how wide it needs to be, and we'll make a landing strip. And he said, well, that will take several days. And she said, people will die if we don't get that, and it will take several weeks to get it here over land. So Bob started praying. And he got back on the radio after a few minutes, and he gave them the length and the width of the landing strip that needed to be built for the airplane that he had. And so he, he prayed and prayed and prayed, and he made sure that he got the vaccine and that it was ready to go. And he put it in the, in the airplane, and he waited. And two days later, they called back on the radio, and they said, the landing strip is made. Please come and deliver the vaccines so that we can get these shots and save everyone's lives. And so Bob said, okay. Well, he knew something about the way that Green Lake was. You see, Green Lake was a little tiny village right at the foot of a mountain. And it wasn't level ground. So he was a little bit concerned about where they might have put the landing strip, but he said, you know what? I will go and I'll trust God to help us get the, the medicine there. And so he took another nurse in the airplane with him, and then the nurse that was at the village to begin with was there waiting for the vaccine, and he took the vaccines and he took off and he started to fly. And he flew high and he flew fast, as fast as the airplane could go to get it there more quickly because some people had already started to die. And he wanted to save as many lives as possible. So he prayed before he went. And he said, Lord Jesus, please help me to get this vaccine to the people. They need it so badly. Without it, they will die. And so he flew the airplane to Green Lake and he circled around the mountain, and he, saw, he found the village of Green Lake. He had, he had circled over it before many times, but never before was there a landing strip. And as he looked this time, when they said they needed the medicine so badly, he couldn't see a landing strip either. Even though they said there was one, he couldn't see one. And so he got a little bit lower and a little bit slower, and he circled again. But he had to be careful not to hit the mountain in his circle. And he was getting lower and slower, and he looked, and finally, he saw something that looked like a goat path. It looked like a very narrow little trail that went partway up the mountain and then stopped right at the edge of the mountain. And it was not straight. And it was crooked. As a matter of fact, it went one direction, and then it went off like that to the left after a few hundred yards or meters. And he was getting very concerned. Now, he was flying a very capable mission airplane. It was very strong. It was a very good airplane. But the other thing was that he had asked them to put um, rocks and paint them white every um, 50 meters along the edge of the runway so that he could see his distance. Well, they put the rocks in the middle of the runway, not at the edge of the runway. And Bob was getting very concerned, but he knew that if he didn't land and get this vaccine to the people, that more people would die. So he said, Lord, please help me. He said, Lord, please help me figure this out. And so he got slower and slower and lower and lower. And it's not like many people think. When an airplane is lower and slower, it's more dangerous 
for the people inside. So he was concerned and he was praying and praying and praying and praying. And this airplane was what we call a tail dragger. It had two main wheels in the front and a little tiny wheel in the back. And it was a very powerful airplane for the adults in the audience uh, congregation. It's called a Cessna 185. So it was a powerful missionary aircraft. But these rocks painted white were spaced every 50 meters down the runway. So he was very concerned that he was going to hit one of those. But the the airstrip was so narrow that he was scared that he was going to drag a wingtip into the, the jungle on either side. And it turned about 25 degrees. Um, a thousand feet down. So he was concerned. Anyway, he lined up and he brought it in over a huge tree because he couldn't land over the mountain. The mountain was on one side and this huge tree was over the other side. He brought it in just over stall speed over this huge tree and settled down and banged the airplane onto the ground and then kicked the tail one way and then the other and then the other and then the other back and forth to miss the white rocks that were about the size of softballs painted on the ground. So as he opened the door, he turned the airplane off, the propeller stopped spinning so it was safer for people to come near, and he could hear the people in the background and in the jungle, and you know what they sounded like? I'll see if I can do it. No, 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 no. And that meant they were very, very happy. They were thrilled to see that the airplane had made it. And so he and the nurse and the other nurse who came from the village, they unloaded the vaccines and they very quickly started giving people shots. And they gave shots for most of the day until every person who needed a shot was able to get a shot. And then he had a problem because he wanted to take off and go back to Addis Ababa, the capital city in Ethiopia. But that tree was there and he said, okay, Um, let's just cut the tree down and then I can take off more easily because he had to he had to go in the opposite direction to the way he landed and that tree was going to be a problem and they said oh no I'm sorry this is a sacred tree you cannot cut it down and he said "Um, I have money I'll buy the tree and then I'll cut it down and he said oh no you cannot sell or buy a sacred tree because he had a chainsaw in the back of the airplane just in case for things like this. So he went and he paced out, counting the number of feet, the number of meters that he had. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to get the airplane airborne and over the tree by the time they would get to the tree. But he said, Lord, please help. We've delivered the vaccines. And if it's your will, please help us to get back home to our families tonight for him and the nurse. And so he said, why don't we do this? Let's back the airplane up. And it just took a lot of people to push the airplane back up. So the tail was in the jungle at the edge of the mountain. And then he said, I'm going to have a lot of people holding on to the airplane, onto the tail and the struts. Those are things that hold the wings up. And he said, and I will have my window open. And when I go like this with my arm, all of you let go. And so he ran up all 300 horsepower and held the brakes and the people were holding on and it just got louder and louder and more and more uh, windy behind that airplane as that big propeller whipped up the, the breeze behind it. And finally he went like this and the people all let go and he started accelerating. Now it was downhill So that was good, but he had that turn partway through, which he negotiated okay. He was almost airborne by that point, so it was interesting. He got airborne, and he said, I was looking, and I'll tell you more about this in a minute, who it was. Can any of you guess? Knowing that his name was Bob, can you guess who it might be? It was my daddy. My daddy, yeah. Yeah. My daddy's name is Bob, too. Anyway, he was looking right at the middle of the tree, and it was coming closer and closer and closer. And finally, he did something which you should probably never do. Except he thought, maybe this might work. In that airplane, there's something called wing flaps. And in most airplanes, you put the wing flaps down with a a motor. There's a, a switch, and a motor puts them down slowly. In this airplane, it had a large 
uh, lever right on the cockpit floor and you could pull the lever up and put different notches or amounts of wing flaps on at the same time uh, instantly. And so Bob reached down and just before he was about to hit that tree, he pulled on full flaps right up to his armpit. And what that does, it makes the airplane go up, but it makes it go slower too. And that is not a good thing when you're trying to take off. You want to go up and get faster. But he had to go up desperately. And so the airplane ballooned up and it hit the top of the tree. And he could hear the propeller going, cutting all the sticks and branches and stuff was flying around him. But the airplane kind of nosed over and he lowered a, a little bit of the flaps and it started down the mountain just over the treetops, and he was hitting occasionally the treetops with his landing gear as he was going. And eventually he was able to fly it out and fly the airplane home and land on that 14,000-foot runway back in Addis Ababa. So do you think he learned a lesson about trusting God? I think he did. He learned that even when things don't look like they might work by natural sources, sometimes God can work a miracle for things to happen. And God made the airplane safe to fly home. And it did have a few dents in it. He landed with some trees, I mean some branches and, and leaves and stuff all over the airplane and a few little dents, but he made it. And he was able to save those lives with the medicine. So here's what I'm asking for you to do as young people. Trust Jesus to help you even when things don't look like they can be helped by normal means, sometimes God can do a miracle, amazing miracles for you. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these young people. I thank you for their attention. I thank you for working miracles in all of our lives in various ways so that we can be closer to you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. You can go back to your seats. Have you ever wondered, why do we give a tithe of all? Well, maybe the best answer is because our God is the provider of all. Paul says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. After his victory against a powerful coalition of enemies, Abraham gave Melchizedek the priest a tithe of everything, food, goods, and possessions. Jacob, his grandson, promised to return a tithe of everything. And according to Leviticus 27.30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Jesus himself acknowledged that tithing was from all I get and from the smallest gain. What could be the reason for this emphasis on tithing everything? Well, this real value of tithe is not monetary, but symbolic. It reminds us to acknowledge and remember God as the giver of all. Ellen G. White says that he asks us to acknowledge him as the giver of all things. And for this reason, he says, of all your possessions, I reserve a tenth for myself, besides gifts and offerings, which are to be brought into my storehouse. A partial tithe would mean that God is the giver of only part of what we need. A well-known trust game called The Blind Swing helps us to understand the value of depending on God as the giver of all. In this game, you close your eyes and allow two individuals to swing you to and fro. After some time, you experience the peaceful sensation that results from complete trust. And this is possible only when you keep your eyes completely closed and choose not to peek from time to time. Perfect peace is the outcome of perfect trust. In a world of uncertainties and confusion, the exercise of tithing from everything, an act of total dependence, will definitely contribute to our inner peace. What message is your tithing practice sending to your brain and heart? Let us grow in heavenly peace as we return our tithe and promise, which is our regular and systematic offerings. 
May we put our desires last and God first. Dear Lord, thank you for the gifts you've given us so that we can return them to you. And Lord, we ask that you please bless this tithe and offering to further your work. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we, the scripture reading is next. Today's scripture reading is in Numbers 22, verses 21 through 32. We will read alternatively. So Balaam rose in the morning, settled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. We will read alternately. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went to the princes of Moab. Huh? Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So that Balaam, so Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back to the road. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. And Balaam said unto the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And he, 
bowed his head and fell flat on his face. Altogether, the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck the donkey these three times? Behold, I come out to you, against you, because your way is perverse before me. That ends the strip. That ends the reading of the Lord's word. You may be seated. Uh, good morning, church. The song I'm going to be singing is entitled Heaven Song by Phil Wickham, if you ever want to look it up afterwards. Um, but basically, the artist says uh, just how he's, like, restless for the place where he's, like, su- where he's supposed to go. Um, and I hope you're blessed by it.
Let's give Brother Jonas another round of applause and hearty amen. Thank you so much for that special. It takes special hand-eye and brain coordination to play and to sing. I tried that once with the guitar and the music went one way and my voice would go another. Lovely, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Sister Eliana for reading us our scripture. And I want to thank Chaplain Mills for that story. When he said Baba, I was like, wow, I didn't know you were a pilot. But that was a nice story you shared. Thank you so much. As it was for the children, I think that was a lesson for us as well, amen? So I want to thank you so much for that. It's been quite an interesting week. I, with all that transpired this week, I wanted to change my message, and I was like, Lord, what can I say? What can I do? What should I say? And as I prayed and I asked for the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Lord was like, you know, you went to great lengths to prepare this message. Just, just go on with it. And the words that I speak to you will be the words of the Holy Spirit. But with the events and with a lot of things that's happening in this world, we are living in some perilous times, amen? Yeah. People would say, I remember as a teenager, we've had mass shootings and we've had different types of you know, calamities, but I think what we're seeing now more and more each day is what they say, call the universality of things happening all at once. And just when you think things are good and things are peaceful and things are steady, sudden destruction comes out of nowhere. So that's why we have to live every day as if it's the last. Amen? And I think as we mourn and as we pray for the families of loved ones that were killed over the last couple of weeks, it's also a sign for us and a reminder that we're not supposed to be comfortable here. Are you with me, church? That these signs point to us or are lessons for us to look beyond, to trust in Jesus, and to be ready for his soon return. Because right now, we're being judged, believe it or not. Our, 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 our names are being recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the day we die, or if Jesus comes, that's it. So let us live every day as if it's the last. And in addition to that, as we live every day as if it's the last, let us live not only in reference to our relationship with Jesus Christ, but let us work towards our relationship with each other. Not just in this church, but wherever it is. Let bygones be bygones. Learn to forgive. Learn to forget. And learn to incorporate a character that is a likeness like Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, I pray as we study your word and as we look at this lesson that you have instilled in my heart to speak, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts not only be acceptable, but speak through me. Not my words, but thy words. Not my will, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you've seen the title of my message, Lessons from a Talking Donkey, and I think you all know what I'm going to talk about, right? But how many of you have pets? How many of you have some kind of a pet, right? Animals, right? You know, if you think about animals, you know, there are a lot of things we can learn from animals. L animals have some valuable lessons that if we take time to observe, you can see the simplicity of how they just live, and they just live every day as a time live every day, you know, for its own. Matter of fact, the wise man Solomon in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 25 to 28, gives an interesting observance of some animals that he mentions here in these verses. He starts out by saying, Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. He said, hydraxes, which are gopher-like creatures, he says, are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the crags. He says, locusts have no king, yet they advance together in, rack, in ranks. He says, a lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is found 
in the king's palaces and also in our houses as well. Yeah, we, I grew up with lizards running around the house. I remember coming by and opening the door to my new place only to have a lizard beat me to the entrance. Animals, they played a significant role in aiding our prophets and patriots in the Bible. It was a raven and a dove sent from Noah's ark to look for dry land. On the seventh month, the ark rested on Mount Ararat. Ravens fed Elijah as he hid in the cave, fleeing for his life. A big fish rescued Jonah after being tossed overboard due to his disobedience towards God. Animals in a stable witnessed the birth of our Savior. Animals. They have a keen awareness also of danger or threat when something terrible is about to happen. They have a better sense than we as humans do. There's scientific data and research to show that right before an earthquake, either a day or two, or hours before an earthquake, animals behave in unusual patterns. I was watching a clip, a mini documentary about the tsunami of 2004. And in Thailand, a particular tourist group that takes tourists on elephants that normally would take them for elephant rides near the the, uh, the beach, One, on that particular day, I want to say about maybe three hours before the tsunami hit through Thailand, the, the tour guides that were with the tourists noticed that the elephants were not going the usual path. They never had to tell the elephants where to go. The elephants exactly knew where to go, but for some interesting day, for some, for some interesting reason, those elephants decided to take another rope and go up to a high hill where they can overlook the beach. And I want to say less than an hour while everything looked calm and while the, the, the guides of the elephant were kicking the ears of the elephant and trying to redirect it to go to the normal route, the elephants just took that other scenic route, which was really scenic because it was up on a hill. And before you know it, they saw and they witnessed that tsunami ravaged right through that village or right through that town while they were up on dry ground. Animals. And by the way, dogs are better, are really good alarm systems. If you have a dog, they can really sense when somebody is approaching your door even before you know. But you know what I found really interesting? That we were made head over the animals, yet at times they are intelligent, and alert to sensing danger beforehand than we humans are. Are you with me, church? So my message is entitled, Lessons from a Talking Donkey. Have you ever seen a donkey? Have you ever interacted with a donkey? They're interesting creatures, you know? If you've been to some places in the world, they are just, as you would see dogs and as you would see cats, it's not uncommon to see donkeys or to hear them in the morning. How many of you have been in a place where a rooster wakes you up in the morning? I've been around this here. How about a donkey? Have you ever been to a place where you hear the donkey neigh, uh, a braying first thing in the morning? I have. Oh, yeah. They'll wake you up all right. Now, I'm not going to try to do donkey sounds either. But they're fascinating creatures. You know, they're hardworking, number one, and they can carry loads twice the amount we can bear. They can travel in rugged terrain and steep terrains with a whole bunch of cargo on their back, more than what we can carry on ours. And I've witnessed this on several occasions in different parts of the world where I am going up a rugged terrain, up, a, up almost a mountain, and there comes a donkey with its master with a full load just walking down the hill like it's nothing. And I'm struggling with just a water pack, you know, trying to get to the top of a hill. Interesting. But on the flip side of their work ethic, donkeys can be stubborn. And if a donkey doesn't want to move, and you do everything you can, uh, it's not going to move. And if you try to get a little more aggressive, believe me, the donkey will let you have it. I've heard people being kicked by donkeys because the donkey didn't want to do what it was supposed to do. But it was very interesting that in this story that as people may look at donkeys as stubborn and dumb, it was interesting that the Lord used the wisdom of a donkey to talk some sense into a man that made a foolish decision. Are you with me, church? So we read the scripture 
of Balaam saddling his donkey and going towards the Moabite officials, and the Lord was trying to deter him with the angel, and, you know, he's beating down on the donkey. But I want to take you a couple verses back. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Numbers chapter 22 and verses 1. So this is the scenario before, as we call it, the talking donkey incident. It says here in uh, Numbers chapter 22, verses 118, if you have it, say amen. And it says, now Balak, son of Zippor, and I'm reading from the New, uh, the New International Version, it says, Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. Verse 4 said that the Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab, sent five messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor, near the Euphrates River, in his native land. Balak said... A people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left taking with them the fee for the divination. And when they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. He said, spend the night here. Balaam said to them, I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite official stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people has come out of Egypt, covers the face of the land. Now come put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But get this. Verse 12 says, God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Talking about the Israelites. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, Go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other officials, more numerous, more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come, put a curse on these people for me. So I guess no the first time was not enough for King Balak. But verse 18 says, But Balaam answered them, Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his place, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. I'll spend the night here so I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night, God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. I'll stop right there. So here we see in this scenario, the children of Israel are camped along the Jordan across from Jericho in the previous chapters of Numbers. They endured being bitten by venomous snakes because of their griping. And Moses had to... God told Moses to create a, a, a serpent of bronze and to lift it high up so when these individuals who are stricken by the serpent can look at the serpent and be healed. They travel through the Moabite and Ammonite kingdoms, defeating Shion, the king of the Ammonites, and Og, and now they're settling along the Jordan across from Jericho. And as the Israelites are resting from all that they have endured, they are close to obtaining the promised land. After crossing the inhospitable climate of the Sinai Desert and crossing over the regions of the Moabite and Ammonite kingdoms, they are met with hostility. And believe it or not, they were related to those nations that were warring against them. The Moabites and the Ammonites were the descendants of Lot, okay, who was, uh, of course, nephew of Abraham, right? And now they are camped along the banks of the Jordan, across from Jericho, taking a pause from such a treacherous journey. 
But God was with the Israelites through their journey, and his favor was upon them. And even in their rebellion and griping, God was patient with the Israelites. His grace sometimes can seem unfair. Sometimes I ask a question, and people would say, well, there's a saying that goes out there, favor is not fair. But then I ask the question, why would God show favor to such a stiff-necked people? And also keep in mind that given their successes in battle through the eyes of Balak, king of Moab, the Israelites are seen as a threat. And now Balak is calling upon Balaam, a prophet, to do him an unholy favor to go and curse the Israelites. Now it's very interesting. God is telling Balaam, do not curse the Israelites, for they are a blessed people. And most of us are taught that to achieve success, and when we achieve success, we are given the notion that being successful can make life easier for you. But sometimes, on the contrary, the more you attain and the higher you go, the more enemies you create. And the Israelites, for some reason, had that problem with their neighbors and the nations they encountered. All the Israelites wanted to do was to get to the promised land. But they were constantly met with hostility. All the Israelites wanted to do was reach the promised land. And throughout the Old Testament, especially through the five books of Moses, when you read about their journey, if it wasn't external enemies that was trying to de destroy them, it was the enemies within their circles that was trying to destroy them and make things difficult. There's always something to get in your way when you're striving to reach an end goal. And when you're trying to accomplish something for God's purpose, there is always something or someone to get in the way, especially if they're supposed to be God-fearing. Can I get a witness? Are you all following me so far? So who was Balaam? Well, according to the book of Numbers, Balaam was a non-Israelite prophet who was the son of Beor. And that's as much as we know about him in Numbers, who, who, his origins and who he was. However, King Balak, who was the king of Moab, recognizes that the Israelites are not a force to be reckoned with. And he feels threatened by their presence, so he's asking a prophet who has daily communions with God. He's asking Balaam to go curse them, but God explicitly tells Balaam and warns him not to do so. Now let's talk about going against what we know is right. Twice. Balaam is telling King Balak, hey, look, I can't do this. I can't do this. And every time that Balaam says no, the king says, well, let, let me try a different angle. Let, let, let me try and, and, and uh, sweeten the deal with maybe some gifts and maybe something. So, so in other words, it's interesting how someone who is devoted to God, someone who is called by God to be a prophet that's not part of the Israelites but has a relationship with God, is warned not to do something, but yet is sort of enticed by the external favors and is sort of enticed by authority figures who wants to put him in a compromising position. Are you following me, church? Sometimes politics, if we're not careful, as much as we're God-fearing, can put us in to a compromising position. When... In those days, your success and your prosperity weighed on blessings and curses from family and from prophets. Classic example, the prophet Samuel told Saul that the kingdom, his kingdom will be taken from him and given to David or given to someone else. It was the prophet Nathan that told David, because of his sin with Bathsheba, that the child that she bore him was going to die. Now, it's very interesting. I can give you an example. I know people who do not want to have kids, and in my conversations with them, the reason they do not want kids is not because of the responsibilities or they will not be good parents. The reason they don't want kids, they don't mind being married, but the reason they don't want children is because they knew how they were growing up and how hard and difficult they made it for their parents. Now, there's an unwritten curse or an admonition when parents would look at you, especially in your teenage and young adult years, and they say, 
Wait till you have kids. But some parents will stop there. But other parents would go further to say, wait till you have kids. They're going to be worse than you. Are you with me, church? You see where I'm going with this? So admonitions, blessings, and curses can really have an impact on the individuals or can have an indirect uh, impact on the life and the course one takes. But you know what I found? Parents always get the sweet revenge when they see you struggling with your little ones as they once struggled with you. And that's why I tell children and I tell people that obedience in your youth and the choices you make in your youth are very important. Can I get a witness? Because where I come from, they say, those who do not hear, feel. And in Balaam's case, he was fortunate. You would think much, you know, you don't think much about Balaam, but the Bible makes other references to Balaam. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 15, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 15. The Bible actually makes a sort of an example in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 15. Here's what he says. He says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with you the wisdom that God gave him. He said, let's see. yes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading chapter 3, I mean, <laughs> my bad. He says, okay, uh, chapter 2 verse 15 says, They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness, but... He was rebuked for his wrong wind by a donkey, a beast without speech who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So here we see where the New Testament makes reference to Balaam. Jude makes reference to Balaam, talks about the greediness of Balaam, and Revelations 2.14 talks about Balaam and says, them that, they, them that hold the doctrines of Balaam. Now, you've heard the notion, don't be a Judas, meaning don't be a traitor. But when they say don't be a Balaam, they're talking about knowing what's right, doing what's right, but yet going in your own admonition to go against God. So early on, Balaam had decided to obey the Lord, but the king's enticement of his riches and favors got the best of his decision. In other words, he went back on what was expected on him, so Balaam is in route to go against God in cursing the Israelites. And as he is on his way to the path of disobedient, God intervenes. So let's look at the passage here in, X, uh, in Numbers chapter 22, verse 21. This is Bel uh, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, went with the Moabite officials, but God was furious when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Didn't get the hint. Then the angel of the Lord moved ahead, stood in the narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down on the Balaam. He was angry, beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said, Balaam, what have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I only had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. Well, let me pause here for a second. If I knew I was going down a wrong path where God was not pleased, because let's face it, how many of you have gone down a path knowing you shouldn't go, but you keep on going? Let me see your hands. Come on, let's be brave. I can admit. I can admit to that. And I have seen where God has caused disappointments and has put obstacles in my way. And rather sometimes than us seeing it as God intervening to prevent us from disobeying his will, we keep pushing and we keep pushing. 
And this is what happened to Balaam. Now, if that was me, and all of a sudden, let's say I was walking Bella, going to do something I shouldn't do, and Bella started talking to me, say, hey, John, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I think I would just run. I would have run. I would not have even stayed. I would not have even had a debate or a dialogue. I would have run, or I think I would have just bowed down and said, Lord, <laughs> save me. The donkey says to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? Meaning if certain things are always going a certain way and all of a sudden a pattern is changed and something is not going right, that is a moment for us to pause. Then it says here, I like verse 31, then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn so he bowed low and fell face down. Brothers and sisters, I want to say with life and the course of life that we are traveling down is different for each and every one of us. But some of us are probably going down a road that maybe we shouldn't. Or maybe we're, we're going through life and there are obstacles in the way and we are just with our mindset trying to just go in this one direction and God is doing everything he can to get our attention but somehow we're just still going and we're still pushing and we're still persevering thinking that well let me tell you this sometimes you have to persevere because sometimes there are obstacles towards what you're trying to achieve in life but there are times when obstacles come in your way because the path that you're taking is not a right one are you with me church so it says, the Lord opens Balaam's eyes. And brothers and sisters, how many times has the Lord opened our eyes to see where we're going, but we still are bent, are going our own way? Verse 32 says, the angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is reckless before me. So God not only opens Balaam's eyes, but he speaks to him. I told you, Balaam, it was not only the Israelites that had prophets, you know, other nations had prophets too that were in communion with God. The angel goes on to say, the donkey saw me and turned away from me three times. Remember I told you, smart donkey, foolish man, right? If it had not turned away, I would have certainly killed you by now. But I would have spared it, meaning he would have spared the donkey. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. And the angel said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's official. Now, my brothers and sisters, let me ask you this. How often have we been bent on going down the wrong path in life? To be diverted, but yet we want to continue. And I want to share four lessons learned from this scenario. So here are four lessons we can learn from a wise donkey that talked. And this is the only instance where you see in the Bible where an animal had to talk some sense in to a so-called man of God. Are you with me, church? You would think Balaam was just an ordinary sinner, and he didn't care, and he was just going to go and go what God was trying to get him to tell him. But this was a prophet of God making a calculated decision that was going against God's will, yet God had to use extreme measures to get his attention. So what are the, uh, here, here are four lessons that we can learn from this talking donkey. Number one. Keep in mind that God is merciful when we are willfully obedient. Can I get a witness? God is merciful when we are willfully obedient. In fact, many of us are going down the wrong way in our Christian life and cannot understand why things are not going out, uh, not working out. In fact, Proverbs chapter 14, verses 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Are you with me, church? Many of us are going through our own way, doing it our way. There's a song that says, I did it my way. I did it my way. And if you keep down that road for a while, or if you've seen that 
always wanting to do things your way is not profitable for you, it's probably time you pause and reflect and see what God has in store for you. So bear in mind, my brothers and sisters, God is merciful when we're willfully obedient. But by me saying that, I want you to take note of this, my brothers and my sisters. This does not give you a license to sin. This does not give you a license to continue going down the wrong path. Are you with me, church? Number two, lessons learned from this talking donkey. God gives us a warning sign through setbacks and disappointments. Can I get a witness? Setbacks and disappointments of God's way of trying to reach us. Sometimes God has to stop us through disasters, setbacks, delays, in order to save us. A good lesson here is the Apostle Paul. Paul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, thinking that he was doing God's work. And we know the story. God threw him off his horse. He was blind for three days. But then he humbled himself, and God used him in a mighty way. Amen? Amen. Joe is another classic example. Joe had openly disobeyed God when God told him to go to Nineveh. Instead, he went on a boat going to Tarsus, and we know the story. A big fish swallowed him. But yet, Jonah repented and went on the course that God had for him. Now remember, Balak was going to curse the, Chile, the Israelites, God's chosen people who were blessed. And this is also a lesson for us that we lose when we think we ought to go tearing down people. Are you with me, church? All right. And number three, keep in mind that God goes the extra mile to save us from ourselves. Are oh, you guys awfully quiet? I'm going to say it again. <laughs> God goes the extra mile to save us from ourselves. God sees beyond our inadequacies, and he works to win us over even when we're headed down the wrong path. God said he could have killed, God could have killed Balaam. And I found it really interesting. There were instances where God killed people within the Israelite camp like this for their disobedience. But there was something special about Balaam that God said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work with this individual a little bit. And I'm going to show him my grace, my mercy. And some of us, though, would have just kept on going. I would say, if we were in that time frame now and not recognize this as God, I think some of us would have, been, would have been killed. And sometimes I have to say, when things are not working out in your life and you're so stressed and, 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 and you're trying to figure out why are things not going the way they should go, Sometimes, rather than take a pause, we keep, going, we keep on going and keep heading in the wrong direction like the, East, like the uh, Energized Bunny. Just keep going and going and going. I think sometimes we have a tendency to believe because we're working for the Lord and we're, we're people of faith, that by our busyness and not taking time for the Lord, that it's okay. But you have to have that moment when you need to pause, reflect, and see what God has in store for you. I want to read a quote from an author by the name of Laurie Beth Jones. She is a uh, executive coach, Christian, and she wrote a book titled Jesus CEO. She says, there is a fine line between knowing when opposition is God trying to show you another way or when it is just a test of courage. She said, if the passively opposing force causes you to use violence to get to move, you probably are not on God's path. If you do everything you possibly can to get something to happen and it doesn't, then an angel must be on the road somewhere. So don't beat the donkey. Take a little time out. Smell the flowers. Rethink your route. Many times when you feel the farthest from the truth, you are very close to it. And get this, she said, and when you think you're on top of the world, you can be sitting in a very dangerous place. Can I get a witness? And lastly, it is time for us to open our eyes, humble ourselves, and submit to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? It's time to submit to God. Uh, James chapter 4, 
verses 7, 8, 10 says, Humble yourselves, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Come near to God, and God will come near to you. Humble yourselves before God, before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know, have you ever heard of a thing called a self-righteous pride? Oh, yeah. I know a lot of Christians who walk like that. They figure, oh, well, because they don't do certain things and because they live a certain way, you know, they figure, well, you know, in the optics of our eyes, it's like, wow, this brother, this sister, wow, they have it all together. Oh, man. Have you ever been around some people, they seem to have it all together that they make you feel like, my gosh, I probably need to pray a little more. I'm probably sinful, right? Have you ever, been, have you ever seen individuals that make you feel that way? Come on, am I talking to somebody here this morning? Oh, yes. And sometimes in their own pride and in their own rationale, they figure, because I keep the commandments of God. And let me get this. Balaam was not breaking any of the Ten Commandments. He was not calling God's name in vain. He was not stealing. He was not going to commit adultery. He was not, no. He was just going to do the king a favor and just put a curse on God's people. Say, curse you. He could have said, all right, king, hey, curse you, Israelites. Hey, I did it. But he said, no, no, no. God told me not to do this, and I'm not going to. Yet, he decided to do his own thing. The problem is when we don't draw an eye to God and we don't make an effort to resist the devil, many times we find ourselves going down that path. And I want to say, my brothers and my sisters, some of us are far away going about life the wrong way and beating ourselves into disaster. And as much as we feel that we are serving the Lord and as much as we feel that we have a relationship with God, there are some things that are not working out in our lives that the Lord is trying to get our attention, but somehow we're not seeing it. Some of you have gotten to the point where you once felt God's leading, but you don't feel it anymore. And I want to ask, are you feeling that way, my brothers and my sister? Sometimes we're so busy caught up in our own lives and in our own mess that we feel that God can't help us, but I want to let you know that there is hope. So as we're going through life, and as we're taking the course of life, and as we're trying to do, and when we're trying to sense the leading of the Lord, pay attention to those obstacles. Pay attention to those setbacks. Pay attention to those disappointments. Humble yourself and ask the Lord, what would you have me to do, O Lord? Here I am. Your servant speaks. Speak to me, Lord. And the Bible said we can ask, the, you know, if, if, if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Lord not give us good gifts, even the Holy Spirit? So it is my prayer, my brothers and my sisters, that the lessons we learned here from the talking donkey, that we keep in mind that... God is merciful when we are willfully disobedient. Keep in mind that God gives us a warning sign through setbacks and disappointments. Keep in mind that God goes the extra mile to save us from ourselves. And keep in mind that it's time we open our eyes, humble ourselves, and submit to the will of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless and keep you as we try and we do our best to follow his will and his guidance. God bless.
Dear Lord, as we're about to go to our respective places, may we go out with joy and be led forth with your peace. Now, Lord, may you bless us, keep us, may you make your face shine upon us. May you lift up your countenance, O Lord, and grant us your peace. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are we on? We on. Good morning. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Chaplain Logan, for that sermon. Good reminder of that donkey in the road. Thank you. Um, are there any visitors with us today? Any visitors visiting with us for the first time today? Any visitors? Because I know I see a couple of people I've not seen before. Hmm. Well, it's okay if you don't want to stand up. We just want to welcome you here today. We're very glad that you decided to come and worship with us here. I pray and hope that you will come back and visit with us again. And next time, um, just stand up and share a little something, something about yourself so we can recognize you and our members can come and uh, welcome you here. Uh, after our announcement. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you again. And if you have any questions about anything that happened in the church today or regarding the sermon, Chaplain Logan is right here, and he'll be more than happy to speak with you. Amen, Chaplain Logan? Amen. Thank you. Okay, so let's move forward with our announcements today. May, May 29th which is tomorrow. So board members, we have a meeting tomorrow at 0900. I know today is um, a three-day weekend, so we hope to see everyone tomorrow at 09 a.m. here at the church for our board meeting. June 6th through the 11th, there is a general conference virtual exhibition experience those who are interested could register online, and there is a website um, on the screen here that you can um, write down, and if you don't have time to write it down, just ask um, our members over here with the audio. They will be more than happy to uh, give you that website. On June 24th through the 26th, JUC online campus, there will be an online campus meeting 
And for more information, you also need to go online um, at ventus.jpcampmeeting slash seminar. So if you're interested in attending this online camp meeting, please ensure that you go to the website. On June 12th, we are going to have another work B starting here at 09 o'clock. So that is June 12th, 09 work B here at the church. And we hope to see most of you all here. Now, uh, throughout the week, we have several meetings online, 6 o'clock on Sunday, and the Zoom number is listed. We have our men's uh, Bible study, and it really sounds like they are talking about some really good things. So, men, if you haven't joined the meeting, take the time out to be a part of this meeting, this wonderful experience. I, I see my husband, and I'm kind of listening in. I'm thinking, you know, I want to join that meeting, but I think because I'm not a man, I can't come. But So I just listen vicariously. But... Um, Men, it is really, really a good experience, so please take the time out to just join them tomorrow. And I guarantee if you don't like what, they, what you heard on tomorrow, go next week. It's always better each week. So we hope that you will join and participate with the men. Now, following the men's prayer uh, power boost, we have the women's power boost. And I must say, last week it was definitely phenomenal. We talked about praise. Praise, praise, praise. And it was awesome. And it, it changes our lives because when we learn something that we should already know, we start applying it. And when you apply what God has given you, you see the blessings coming down. So I would like to invite all the women who haven't joined our uh, prayer power booth to come and join us next Sunday because this is Memorial Day weekend and we have some women that will not uh, that will not be here because of that. So the following Sunday we will definitely have our women's prayer power booths. Now each morning at 520 to 530, Chaplain Mills in Virginia has started a um, a prayer session. And again, this is definitely a phenomenal experience because you wake up coming together to pray. And we know that where two or three are gathered, God is in the midst and he will hear our prayer. So I wake up most of the time to join that meeting. Even if I'm five minutes late, I want to be a part of that experience because I know Jesus is there. So if you're up around 520, 519, just Come on the Zoom line, just get your little 10-minute uh, time with God and see how your experience throughout today will be different because you started it with God. So I hope to see you all in that um, uh, meeting on, I guess, Tuesday? Tuesday, we're going to do it Monday. Monday, Memorial Day? They will be there on Memorial Day. Okay. Okay, we're, we're going to do our best to be there. Memorial Day at 520, 520. And, of course, we have a um, prayer meeting every Wednesday. That's also online from 7 to 8. Sometimes we go a little over, but it's okay because we're, we're not going to impede the Holy Spirit as he blesses us throughout the um, midweek to give us that power boost to move forward until we meet him on Sabbath. And we have family worship every Friday, every first Friday of the month at 7 p.m. Um, so we invite you all to uh, join our, our Zoom church. Uh, I guarantee you, you will not leave that platform disappointed. So with that said, we have Sabbath school following these announcements. Um, we have our Sabbath school lesson here from the um, Sabbath school book. We also have our children's uh, back behind uh, on my left side. We have the beginners or the baptismal class and the pastor study. And we also have the children, the youth, the, the primary upstairs in the, conf in the GC conference. And I think that's it. So... 
We thank you all. We hope to see you at Sabbath school. God bless you all. Stay.